Our next speaker is Lisa Tatarin, and she's going to talk about biofeedback and Parkinson's. Please welcome her. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for staying so long in the day. Everyone, is, it's a big crowd, so thank you. I'm here to talk about biofeedback for Parkinson's. And a lot of you have come to me and asked me what biofeedback is, and I'm just going to give you a little brief introduction of what it is, and I'm going to piggyback Dr. Hamilton's talk. It's measuring your physiology and showing it back to you so that you can learn how to change it. And there are many types of biofeedback that are available. There is brainwave biofeedback or the EEG biofeedback. And that's important for Parkinson's because we know now that there are a lot of EEG markers or brain markers that we can target with biofeedback to reverse or um, decrease symptoms. Some of the most important ones are the ones that maybe don't get addressed with your medications like freezing of gait, drooling, um, or balance. So we also have balanced biofeedback, and this was actually developed here at UC, um, in San Diego at SDSU. There's a balance board that's been made to measure your basically limits of stability, how comfortable you are to move around. But inside that balance board, they built a biofeedback program so that you can learn to strengthen your balance and your range of motion. Then there's something called heart rate variability biofeedback. And that type of biofeedback's been around for about 30 years. A lot of executives and professional athletes and um, um, even Olympians use heart rate bio biofeedback. And what that is, is it measures your stress resilience and how well you can center and calm yourself in an event that makes you stressed. Then there's temperature and sweat biofeedback. And that is the oldest um, type of biofeedback that's been around. It's probably 60 years. And um, most of your doctors should know about it because it's been taught in medical school. So temperature and uh, sweat biofeedback are important because Parkinson's does have autonomic uh, dysfunction. And these two types of devices you can readily buy on Amazon and just... Um, warm your body when you're cold, or manage your sweat response as well, too. Another one is muscle biofeedback or EMG biofeedback. So when your um, doctor does a Botox injection, they often use an EMG to detect what muscle is tense, but we can also use that as biofeedback to learn and teach you how to decrease muscle tension, whether it's rigidity in your arms, your neck, your shoulders, and it's very valuable. And I'll say this is personal for me because my mother had a form of dystonia where nothing else responded. Um, she had injections and surgeries and medications. Finally, when she tried biofeedback, it actually released the muscle and she got relief. So that's really important. So let me tell you that the research for biofeedback has been around for 50 years, and a lot of you that have come up to me and said, I can't believe I've never heard of this before. Traditionally, it's been used for incontinence, constipation, migraines, but we've now figured out a way how to use it for Parkinson's, which is fantastic because there are so many motor and non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's, and we figured out how to help people with Parkinson's help themselves, which is basically this day, empowerment. How do we empower you to take control over your symptoms? So let me tell you one of the, the, the newest kid on the block, the heart rate variability. They actually found that people with Parkinson's have lower heart rate variability. And what that means is they don't respond to stress or rebound from stress as readily as they can. What they found was people with lower heart rate variability have a greater chance of having freezing episodes. So you can get a biofeedback device that will increase your heart rate variability. And that's done with just a simple sensor on your ear, and it has an app, and it guides you through a type of breathing called resonant breathing. But it also teaches your whole nervous system to move out of fight or flight into rest and digest. And you'll remember that from what Dr. Hamilton said this morning. So they actually found your heart rate variability can be increased to reduce your chances of freezing of gait. So what it looks like simply on the app is you can see when you're stressed, it's all kind of jagged, and it's up and down. But when you start to get into a calm zone and you feel it, you can see a very nice smooth rhythm. And that rhythm tells you that you can hold calm and be more calm. And as you practice that, your brain and your body start to do it on its own. So it's not something you need to always do, but it's practice. And then as you learn practice with positive biofeedback, you feel better about yourself and you do better as well too. So we also know freezing of gait, this is where I come in, there is another marker for freezing of gait, and it's in the front part of the brain. And so there are a couple companies here that do brain markers, so I, I implore you all to volunteer for brain marker exam or um, ex experiments because it helps us learn what parts of the brain function are working on or off. And so they did find that freezing of gait basically locks up in the frontal lobe. 
and it's kind of like a traffic jam in the front part of your brain. What we can do for freezing of gait is you can actually put sensors, non-invasively, pasted on EEG sensors, and tell the brain to calm down in that area so that the freezing of gait doesn't happen. And as you practice continually doing that calming down of the frontal lobe, the freezing of gait dissipates, and you actually do not have continued freezing of gait. And it's been published, and it's very effective. I have a couple of people who are going to be doing video testimonials of how the freezing of gait has stopped. So we all know that stress makes everything worse for Parkinson's. It also in, it reduces your medication. So well, sometimes when you go in for your six-month checkup, your doctor will say, you've got a lot of stress, let's work on your stress. So what tools do you use for stress? And they say meditation, exercise, any number of things. But there is ways that you can actually directly impact your stress circuit. And they just published um, October of this year that because we've collectively done 50 years of research for neurofeedback, that this is a really viable tool for you to address your stress response. And it's important to put it in your, in your mind to think this is something I can consider, and it's very easy to do. So it's something worthwhile to consider. And again, it moves your body out of fight or flight into rest and digest. But more than just, and this is the exciting part, more than just decreasing stress, we can now specifically target parts of the brain that control movement or control drooling or control urinary incontinence. And when we know is the brain can learn, because this has been published in 2013, so this is a decade now, they started with animal studies, they did the placebo-blinded controlled studies, and now we're moving into how many symptoms can we impact? So the research is coming out very quickly that any part of the brain that produces an EEG signal that's abnormal, which we can mark with Parkinson's, then we can actually teach the brain to re reroute basically what's going on. And what they did in animal studies was they found um, after, unfortunately, they euthanized the animals, <laughs> they cut them open and they saw a whole new network was building because of the neurofeedback. So it makes, it makes a compensatory um, network and that was published as well too. So how do we do it? So basically we, we um, take a measure of your brain with 20 sensors and then it produces a squiggly line, and that's the EEG, the electrical activity of your brain. And then we convert it into a 3D map. So I'm a computational neuroscientist. I love looking at 3D maps, and I, I build them every day. So we know there are the markers in the brain that I look for, and we map them. So in the temporal lobes, your memory, your working memory, your auditory processing, frontal lobe, executive function, um, back of the brain balance, so any number of things. But then it's all interconnected. So if I work on one area of the brain, bring it back online, a lot of times other parts of the brain can also come back online. And we know there are markers for every Parkinson's symptom, just so you know that finally, as of 2023, every motor and non-motor symptom has been located in the brain. So how it works. You simply just get to sit in a very nice reclining chair and watch a video game. We've gamified it. It is so easy to do. So if you can see on the screen, there's a purple spaceship, a blue spaceship, and a yellow spaceship. The purple rest, uh, represents the brainwave that's not good. And so let's say it's your tremor. Every time your tremor is activated, that spaceship will go forward. If you can hold your tremor at bay, finding that quiet sweet spot is what we call it, then your tremor circuitry starts to dissipate. And then also, from DBS, we know that the brain produces too much beta spindles. We can see the beta spindles on the surface of the brain, and we can teach you how to stop them. Which interesting is, and they just published this research two weeks ago, that a certain um, precursor to the beta spindles happens at the surface of the brain that we can see, which is remarkable. So if I break up the slow wave from the fast wave, the tremors dissipate on their own. So you just sit in the chair and watch the feedback and receive and, and uh, respond to the feedback. It's just basically a feedback loop that your brain learns from. And because of neuroplasticity, the brain learns and holds it. So this is an example of when I did home visits. This person um, did <laughs> tremors, and he was able to stop his own tremors, and he explained to me how he did it. Um, and what I do is I pay, pay it forward. So every client that I work with, we pay it forward. How did you learn how to do it so that the next person can learn? And for him, he learned how to stop his tremors by um, breath rate, but also by calm focus. And every time he got a little nervous or agitated, his spaceships or for this game, it changed. And so he learned what quiet calm was. 
And he was able to, after I think 10 sessions, he was able to stop it. And he took a nine year break and I didn't see him for nine years. So I'm like, that's great. And he, his tremors were still stopped. And he came back and he said, can you help me with balance? And of course I can, because balance also is regulated by the brain. But the best thing about what I do or what biofeedback does is it measures everything. So sometimes you're curious about how do I know I'm getting better or what can we show to prove that I'm getting better? Because with the brain map, we can see parts of the brain that are online or offline. So as you can see here, the red area is the brain is not working as well as it can. So traffic jam or not working. And even at the top area, the blue, that's the motor supplementary area. That's the gatekeeper for all movement. When there's no electrical activity in that area, getting out of your chair is going to be impossible. If I put a sensor there and I actually give you the feedback as the brain produces more electrical activity in that area, getting out of my chair is gonna be a lot easier. So just last year they published, you can, you can pair up different types of biofeedback together and get even faster results. So combining neurofeedback with body biofeedback, multimodal biofeedback. In just five sessions, they noticed depression decreased, gait speed increased, and balance improved. So we're working on many different parts of the brain and body at the same time. And here's an example of someone that I work with for two weeks. As you can see on the left in the pre area, she had very slow gait with a hesitant turn. She also has um, a tremor in her arm and I have an accelerometer on the other side as well. And after 10 sessions for her, um, she was moving much faster, um, not hesitant to turn, and no more freezing episodes, and feeling very good about her progress, obviously, because she kept waving at me I was trying to videotape her. <laughs> but that's how, how quickly she responded, and um, to this day, she still holds, and she sends pictures um, of her skiing, and um, she's using those hiking, trek, um, hiking poles, and she sends pictures when she's doing her hikes. So it's holding. And a lot of people ask, does it hold? And I'll get into that in a little bit. We've known for a decade that neurofeedback actually helps physical balance. So part of the brain that helps with balance is in the back, but it also projects to the front. And what they found was after eight sessions of neurofeedback in the back of the brain, they improved static and dynamic balance. So dynamic is being able to weight shift um, when you face a curb, and static is just sort of standing in one spot. And they had such a rapid increase in just eight sessions. So if balance is an issue or fear of falling, come in, we get a fear of falling test, um, we get a limits of stability, and then you can take this to your physical therapist and work on the areas that are weak. So this is an example of someone who did biofeedback and neurofeedback. The first, um, I, on the top one, you can see the blue area. Let's see if I, I want to use the pointer. No, I don't want to bother. Um, so the blue area, you can see that's his limit of stability, how comfortable he is moving in every direction. So you can see the top right is poor and the back left is poor. And the reason why he came to me was he used to be a dancer and he loved to dance, but he was nervous about dancing. And he also carries his coffee up the stairs. And he, he was nervous that he couldn't carry his coffee, he was getting vertigo. So we did some biofeedback and neurofeedback, got his range better, um, got him comfortable with his limits of stability. And I decided, well, let's just see, let's just do a status check. Six sessions, I'm not expecting a lot. And sure enough, <laughs> His range completely got better. So you can see his front, the blue is all filled up. Um, the back left is a little bit an issue because he has an injury that his PT is working on. But he, he did tremendously well in just six sessions, which is amazing. And one thing he told me, oh, and also my vertigo is gone. I wasn't working on vertigo, but it's gone. And now he happily carries his coffee up his stairs every morning. And that was a wonderful thing for him. But he also is starting to dance again. And he is an amazing ballroom dancer, and I asked him permission, and he is looking for a partner. So anyone that lives in North County, <laughs> please volunteer. He dances twice a week at um, a dance studio up, up in Solana Beach and would love a partner. His wife isn't so game, so he wants to find someone who is as passionate for Latin dancing. So please um, reach out to me if, you have, if you're interested in, in a dance partner. He's very good. So does it last? Of course, um, that's a really important question. This study was done 10 years ago through a DTI, and they did find that even though there was white and gray matter damage in the brain, which you can see in an EEG, after doing neurofeedback, it both uh, improved the white and gray matter, and that improves processing and connectivity. So we are changing the circuits, and it does last. One thing that is probably the least 
covered or um, maybe there's not enough treatment out there or maybe we're not working on it enough, but it's attention and memory. So we've known for maybe 20 years a brain brightening protocol for neurofeedback. They've applied it for Parkinson's. And what happens is there's a part of your brain that tells us what your cognitive reserve is, how well you preserve your information. As we age, it decreases over time. It's called the peak alpha frequency, if anyone wants to look it up. And as it decreases over time, your brain slows down. Um, so when you're 70, you're going to be maybe about an 8, an 8.5. When you're 60, it's probably hopefully a 9. But when you've got Parkinson's, it goes as low as a 6. And so I can measure that number and go, wait a minute, we need to increase that number. So I put a sensor where I measure that, that cognitive reserve, and we can actually ask the brain to speed up. And as the brain speeds up in that one area, all the other networks start to come back online. And coincidentally, when I was doing this with a client, um, her hearing system also came back online, and an audiologist independently came and gave me a report saying, her, her, her right ear used to be 60, and now it's 99. So something we weren't expecting, but the brain is, is a miracle. It can do things like that. So what I'm asking you is to think of neurofeedback as something, or biofeedback, to fill in the gaps that where maybe not everything is covered with your medications or um, therapies that you're doing. Cognition is a big one, just speeding up your brain brightening, basically speeding up your cognition. Remarkably, apathy has a marker in the brain. So we can actually put a sensor in the front part of your left side. And it, if we train down the slow activity in that area, your motivation will return. I've seen it happen. It's wonderful. Now, fatigue, oh, let me go back. Uh, OK, I'll talk about fatigue. Fatigue also has a marker. Um, there's also um, freezing gait, like we talked. But I asked clients to say, what should I tell them that's most important to all of you? And just this uh, 2023, a summer of last year, they found a specific marker for Parkinson's for urinary urgency. So there's a part of the brain that controls your bladder for Parkinson's only that I can target with biofeedback that will decrease your urgency. And across the board, it has worked for everyone, so it's pretty remarkable. So they said, make sure you tell them about that. And the second one, just recently published, because I'm a computational neuroscience, I look at circuitries and connectivity, drooling, there is a specific area in your brain that gates the drooling mechanism. If I put a sensor of biofeedback, give you feedback to improve that area, drooling stops. And it's quite remarkable. So those are those two things that other people have told me, make sure they know this. So it's very important. Now, all the research that I've talked to, uh, talked to you about, <laughs> I put it all in one place because I'm more research-oriented than I am anything, and I, I always back up everything I do with research. So our, the articles will be put on there, and you do get a PDF, I believe, of all the PowerPoints, so you can scan that later. Um, I also did a very more extensive support group talk, basically, about all the research behind it and what to expect during a neurofeedback session. Obviously, with 20 minutes, I don't have the time here to do that. But if you wanted to hear the support group talk, it's about 45 minutes, and it's on YouTube. And I go into all in depth, and I answer questions for patients as well, too. But I wanted to thank you, because I know it's the end of the day. And um, I'm, I'm happy that you're here. And I will let you know that there are a lot of things we can do with biofeedback to help you re-regulate your body and get things back online. So thank you.